So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in my talk today. My name is Ayumi Watanabe. Uh, I'm going to talk about Japanese S bomb situation today. So, uh, as you know, S bomb is a big trend for now in all over the world. Uh, in Japan, of course, it is. And maybe you know well about the, what uh, what happening in uh, in your country, or maybe you know well about what happening in the states or the European Union. But how about Japan? Maybe you have no idea. Uh, why? Uh, we are not hiding anything. It's not a secret, but. I would say it is a little bit difficult to find what is going on in Japan. Mm, because much of the information are published only in Japanese. So today I will talk about the s situation in Japan, our challenges, and some governmental guidelines that was released recently. And I translated some of the contents of uh, released materials by Japanese government for you today. So uh, maybe you will go to love it. So let's get it started. What's happening in Japan? So first of all, let me speak a little bit about myself. My name is Ayumi again. Uh, I'm a senior OSS specialist of Hitachi Solutions. And I am an evangelist of the Linux Foundation Japan. And I am a planning leader of Open Chain Japan. I have my LinkedIn account here, so please feel free to contact me. Uh, I am always very happy to connect with open source and S1 people. So before talking about Japan, let's see the S1 situation in the world. I mean, outside of Japan. So today, we have two big national and regional s bomb guidelines standards. So one, of, um, one is an executive order, 14028 of the United States. It's uh, on the top left. And the other is a Cyber Resilience Act of the European Union. It is uh, the top right. Uh, for a European, uh, for a, uh, Cyber Resilience Act of, of European Union, we call it EU CLA. So CLA is a regulation which will be applied to all products that are connected to uh, another device or to a connect or network directly or indirectly. The EU, the EU Council adopted this new law just, uh, just two weeks ago uh, on October 10th. So it was a big news for us because it means uh, now we have only two or three years left uh, to adapt this law to our uh, development process. And in relation to these, now we have many industrial standards and guidelines. Uh, I have some uh, example here. So for example, uh, for medical device, we have the IMDLF and FDA regulations. Japanese Ministry, Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, uh, we call them Kosei Rodosho. So they follow these guidelines. So uh, s bomb and security management uh, are now mandatory among Japanese medical device companies since this April. And for automotive industry, we have WT-29, UNR-155 and 156. And also we have ISO 21434. And we also have NHTSA guidelines. So there are a lot of security guidelines for connected vehicles. And for payment card industry, we have uh, PCI DSS version 4. So uh, for payment card industry, uh, 
that uh, regulation uh, request as one well for now. So as a summary of this slide, I would say no matter what industry you are in, uh, you need to take care about S bomb and security management with S bomb. So over the past year, public sectors in the world released their own S bomb guidelines. So that is all what I found for now. But uh, if you know something that I missed, uh, please let me know. No, I will put them to this slide. But uh, now we have some uh, uh, governmental guidelines in, for example, Germany, uh, the US, and India, Korea, China. And also, we, Japan, has our own this one guideline. I will explain this later. It is really fun to compare the contents to find the different, um, different points, different parts uh, to each other. For example, uh, German guideline. So uh, in NPIA minimum 11, uh, the license information is not a mandatory part, but in the guideline from BSI Germany, it is a mandatory, so this is a difference, big difference. And another example, for example, in Korean guideline, so they have uh, S1 types, like a source S1 or a binary S1 or this kind of S1 type, and the component path uh, seems to be uh, mandatory. And the Chinese one is also very interesting. interesting. So Chinese data format is, um, looks a little bit similar to SPDX for me because they have, uh, a parameter, they have parameters for file information and snippet, and snippet information. So uh, really fun to find uh, the same point and the different point. But uh, uh, also it was very exciting thing to know what uh, that uh, every country every country is really care about this one for now. So in this situation, how Japanese companies are getting along with s -bomb? So to tell you the status of Japanese companies, I will use the result of one survey. This survey was conducted by uh, PwC and the Synopsis, thank you very much. Uh, this this uh, survey is about the S1 situation of Japanese companies. The data is as of March of this year. So according to this survey, uh, out of 110 companies who export digital devices to the EU market, only 27% of companies have done comply with the EU CLA. So even if we have two or three years left, uh, maybe this percentage, this percentage is not so high enough uh, as we expected. And uh, another fact from the survey, uh, they found that Japanese companies have some difficulties in, for example, choosing one S1 format like SPDX and Cyclone DX and uh, updating S1 format product uh, follow, uh, up, uh, sorry, uh, updating uh, S1 following uh, product updates and collecting necess necessary information accurately from your supply chain and uh, difficulties in matching vulnerability information with components. So from this survey, we can see the fact that uh, Japanese companies are not able to take full advantages of s capabilities. And in this survey, I found very interesting data about s format because everybody loves to discuss about format, s format, like on DX or SVDX or something like that. So uh, this is very interesting data. So uh, at first, uh, the chart on the left this is about major S1 format by company size. So let's see the bottom line. So this, this is about 
uh, the, uh, the companies who has who have uh, more than 50,000 employees, so it means very big companies. So the left one, this orange means SPDX users, and the uh, next yellow is uh, SPDX light users. And another, this one red, red for Cyclone DX, and another red is for SWID, SWID. So it seems like uh, a close game for now. Very interesting. And uh, uh, let's see the chart on the right. So this is uh, this is about major S1 format in by industry. So let's see uh, here. So entertainment and the media. So they ha they are. Um, they are maybe like Cyclone DX users. And like here, transportation and uh, logistics like vehicles, ships, and automobile and aircraft. So they have uh, kind of like, kind of like uh, SPDX and SPDX Lite and Cyclone DX and Suede. Uh, they are very equal. So these are very interesting data, but uh, it means we Japanese people could not find and could not decide only one S1 format for use. So this is the situation in Japan. So uh, let's, let's move on to the uh, next topic, uh, what is going on in Japan. This is maybe the main topics of this today. Oh. So uh, what our government is doing for the situation. So now we have a statement which was published by National Center of Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity, uh, NISC, we call NISC of Japan. It is called Cybersecurity 2024. In this statement, they have three priority measures for here. And the second measure is uh, improving economic and the social vi uh, vitality and sustainable development. And uh, in this section, they are stating about increase the use of SBOM for reinforcing cybersecurity for IoT devices and software products. And uh, this is a more practical details of the materials that I explained in the previous slide. So they are stating like uh, ensuring separation and reliability, and they have some activities to promote SBOM and reinforce security measures for IoT devices. And in this uh, activity, they are saying uh, formulate, they will formulate of guide of introduction of software available materials, it's SBOM, for software management. So this is our Japanese uh, SBOM guideline. By the way, have you ever read uh, this Japanese SBOM guideline? No? <laughs> so that's it. Uh, the first version was released uh, in uh, July 28 of last year. Uh, it covers everything about SBOM, for example, the background uh, definition, how to create SBOM, how to share SBOM, and how to use them for vulnerability management, something like that. And uh, personally, I strongly recommend you to read this uh, guideline because uh, for, uh, actually I am a member of review team of this document, so uh, <clears throat> I strongly recommend you to. So uh, this is a very useful information, so it was to read them. And they have English translated version in the link of this QR code, so you can download them and read them. Uh, detail, this is the details of the guideline, but we're gonna speak, skip them, skip it, okay. Okay. 
And in this guideline, they define uh, S1 introduction process divided, divided over three, three phases. So for example, uh, phase one, environment and system uh, development phase. So uh, in this section, uh, they are saying like selecting an S1 tool and learn about the S1 tools to create S1. And in phase two is for S1 production and sharing phase. So it is, this is about use the S1 tool to analyze the components and then uh, produce an S1 and uh, considering sharing the S1 OS users and or suppliers, your suppliers. And phase three is for uh, S1 use and management. So this is about implementing vulnerability major management and license management, and et cetera. So again, this guideline is very practical and a good reference for the, um, I would say, beginners, uh, like uh, the entry level companies. This is a Japanese guideline, but uh, it can be used in everywhere. So it is very uh, useful for every company in the world. And uh, two months ago, Japanese METI released the S1 guideline version two. They added about 60 pages from version one and they did public comment for about one month, then got 100 comments from the public. 100 comment. Uh, this, um, this is very wonderful number because from this uh, we can see how uh, Japanese people are interested in this S1 guideline. This guideline is very new, so we don't have an English version for now. But uh, today I can tell you uh, the contents that added as version two. So uh, the added contents of version two is, for example, detailed vulnerability management process was as form, or framework for considering an appropriate scope of S1 and S1 contract model. They are very useful information. Uh, so I would say this is one of the most practical S1 guidelines in the world. You should check it out. So uh, let's uh, deep dive into the uh, items that, added, that was added to version two. So first item is vulnerability management process. So uh, METI uh, defined this uh, detailed vulnerability management process. The first, the first step is identifying vulnerabilities. So this is about uh, uh, decide, how to decide matching approaches like API or management tool or web API, and uh, also about S1 data and the identifier, and uh, also about vulnerability databases. So now we can use NVD and Japan Vulnerability Notes. It's a, it's a special database for a Japanese product. And of course, we can use SCA or management tools. And uh, uh, they also mentioned about uh, matching uh, vulnerability information with your components. <clears throat> and uh, the second step is prioritizing. So for example, filtering by VEX and prioritizing uh, by uh, risk and the cost, like CVSS or some other cost, and uh, categorizing the level of the vulnerabilities, like SSVC, and uh, scoring with, for example, CAV catalog or EPSS scoring or uh, some other factors. So uh, prioritizing is the most uh, important uh, steps to, uh, in this process. And uh, uh, the third step is sharing information. So with who 
what information to be shared or who can access this information, they are also important. And the final step is mitigation. So they are saying like uh, temporarily, we should do temporary and uh, permanent uh, mitigation. And of course, we should update and uh, re-share re uh, SWOM and VEX after you updated your components. So we can learn how to do vulnerability management with this guideline. And the second item is SBOM uh, compliant model. Medi defined a framework to visualize the transparency level of SBOM. The, this framework consists of the table of SBOM requirements here and the color. The color is a key to use this framework. So let me uh, explain how to use this framework. So uh, for example, if your SBOM supports all layers of direct dependency, you color this area with this green. Uh, green is a color for a positive. And uh, if your SBOM partially support transitive, uh, transitive dependency, you color this area for uh, this pink. So pink is a color for it, not, uh, uh, how do I say, uh, not positive. So uh, after uh, coloring this chart based on your SBOM, maybe you can see this or this. So <clears throat> for example, if you color more green uh, like this, um, uh, your S bomb is high transparent, high, high transparent. It means your security level is low. Otherwise, uh, you colored uh, pink more than green uh, it means you, your S-bomb is low transparency, so security risk, security risk is very high. So with this framework, we can identify your security risk level measured by the transparent uh, level of your S-bomb. And this framework is also useful to identify the recommended the uh, recommended level for each industry like this. So for example, in this uh, chart, uh, uh, medical devices, uh, SBOM is more trans, uh, in, medical in, the, in medical device industry, uh, people need SBOM to be uh, more transparent compared with uh, other software industry, things like that. So uh, this framework is also good for uh, your security level management. And uh, the third item is SBOM contract model. It describes the key points to be agreed between companies uh, over a contract regarding the SBOM. <clears throat> For example, in this uh, contract model, they have S1 requirement about uh, format and the standard. So we should agree with which format do you use or which identifier do you use, for example, CPE or PURL or uh, SOID, or do we cover minimum elements of NTIA or not? And also they have quality and reliability section. So this is about uh, type of contract and do, should, we do, uh, should we cover uh, transitive dependency or not, or scan type, like uh, scan, scan by tools or scan by manual, and uh, uh, do we do manual inspection, or SBOM types, like uh, source SBOM, container SBOM, binary SBOM, or something like that. 
and they also have maintenance and operation uh, area. So, for example, how to how do we share the information like VEX, or how do we update S1 information, or how do we notice uh, vulnerability to the suppliers or your customer and uh, vulnerability prioritize and uh, end of life or the end of sales. And this contract model also covers uh, responsibility and warranty or cost who, who, who pays the cost for the S1 and rights and confidentiality, for example, intellectual property rights or confidentiality. So uh, this is also very useful information for companies who are not uh, familiar with SBOM related contract. Uh, with this contract model uh, as a template, uh, you never miss important things to discuss and agree with your suppliers. And uh, I have one more uh, useful document here. So this is about, uh, this is also uh, published by uh, METI of Japan. Uh, this is a collection of use cases of um, utilizing and management as uh, OSS. We have used, you ha we have case studies of many Japanese companies like uh, Toyota, Sony, Olympus, Hitachi, Omron, Toshiba, Denso, Fujitsu, NAC, and then and NTT, and some other anonymous companies. So uh, this uh, is really useful information, but uh, unfortunately, this document was not translated into English for now. But uh, maybe you can uh, read it with machine translation or something. So uh, please uh, check it out as well. And in this uh, uh, case studies, uh, we Hitachi published our own, uh, our internal uh, S1 management system. The uh, picture, the, uh, the, how do I say, uh, the, uh, on the right uh, area, we can see this, uh, pic these pictures. And this is about our Hitachi's uh, internal S1 management system. So we are using uh, our own created S1 system and we do uh, license management, license compliance management or vulnerability management over on this uh, system. Uh, it may be 10, more than 10 years, but uh, it's a really a good example for your company. So uh, let's summarize my talk today. So I have uh, three uh, key takeaways of this talk. So firstly, S1 is a major concern in Japan. Medi, Japanese Medi has been encouraging companies to make sure of make, uh, make use of S1. So as a part of this effort, the Guide of Introduction of Software Bureau of Materials, version one, was released in July 20, 2023. Then it revised in, it was revised in August 2024. So we have version two for now. And secondly, uh, Japanese companies has been doing open source management for a long time we have a lot of practical uh, experiences of S1, so we are happy to share our knowledge. And as a third, uh, a software supply chain is our common issue. So I believe uh, global collaboration is the key. So if you are interested in this kind of collaboration, please, uh, for example, please uh, contact me to further discussion, or please join our uh, S1 um, study group, uh, which was run by Open Chain Project. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much.
And I have 10 minutes left, so uh, maybe it, uh, are there any comments or feedback or uh, some uh, maybe questions about my talk? I will. Be, I am very happy to answer. Does anybody have uh, feedbacks or comments? Oh, thank you. Hi, I have a one question, or I would like to hear your opinion. Well, in Europe, for example, you see SBOM is mandatory by CRA, but Japan has no regulation, mandatory regulation. Of course, there is a guide and something, but no regulation mandatory. So my question is, um, in this situation, um, do you have any idea which industry is leading to utilize the SBOM in Japan? <laughs> uh. Uh, it is very good question, and uh, maybe this answer is uh, based on my own experience and uh, uh, thought. But uh, I, um, I am thinking the leader should be the automotive industry because uh, they have a lot of suppliers, so they are very nice case study uh, to manage supply chain uh, risk. And also, uh, they, uh, in Japan, we have a lot of uh, big uh, automotive OEMs, and they are very close to collaborate with. So uh, the, I think automotive industry is the best. <laughs> Thank you very much. And does anybody have another comment or feedback question, of course? Nope. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, that's, uh, that's, all for, that's it for me. And uh, I, will be, uh, the, uh, I will be at the, uh, how do I say, uh, Hitachi uh, booth uh, in the uh, sponsor showcase downstairs. So please, uh, can please come to say hi. And uh, I will happy to have a further discussion about SBOM. Thank you very much.